Today we're talking about the five phases of the INFJ's evolution. So if you read something about INFJs online or you watch videos that explain an INFJ, very often it looks at either side of the spectrum, meaning either an INFJ at the beginning of their evolution or at the end of it. And today we're going to look at what the five phases are that lead you from the beginning till the end. And it's not like that's the entirety of your life, but all INFJs will recognize themselves in one of those phases. And most of the time we have gone through, let's say to step four or step five by a rather early age in our life. But the older you are, the higher the chance, of course, that you've reached phase five and are right now in the state of developing your INFJ epic life. Before we get started, I wanna let you know the next INFJ epic life bootcamp round is just around the corner we're launching January 28th so make sure you're on that waiting list you get access to the early bird price and get notified once we go live everything you need to know you can find in the links in the description phase number one the INFJ is oblivious and what I mean by this is the INFJ goes through life this is most of our childhood and we don't recognize that there's something different about us this is when you might consider that some people think you're weird but most of the time you're completely oblivious to that you actually just enter the world and everything seems like it should be because guess what that's how we are born that's how everybody is born in a way of I'm exactly the way I'm supposed to be I like myself I you know approach the world the way I know how to and I don't even question it it's just a little bit later when we become aware how people react towards us that we ask ourselves is there something wrong with me am I weird am I different and we as INFJs who are very good at understanding other people's emotions at reading their cues all of that actually gets us to a space where we recognize rather quickly that people look at us and say okay that person is a little bit off because the thing is this, there are people who are different than most. It's not just INFJs. Yes, we are rare. Okay, I got that. But we're not the only ones who are different. The thing is though, that we're so aware of people's reactions. So many people who are different than the norm are just completely oblivious and stay this way for a very long time. And they may even get to a place where they say, okay, you know, what you're doing is weird. What I'm doing is correct. For INFJs, it's a little bit different. And that's when we get to phase number two. The INFJ gets picked on. You will very rarely meet an INFJ who hasn't been picked on or bullied on when they were a kid. This just doesn't happen for the INFJ, or at least very rarely. I don't think I've ever talked to an INFJ who hasn't experienced that. And so the question is, is it really that we're so weird? No, it's actually the combination of those two things. Because on the one hand, we understand that people look at us and say, okay, you're acting a little differently. This is not what everybody else is doing. What is wrong with you? And on the other hand, because we're so aware of people's reactions <laughs> towards us, we sort of try to understand it. We try to make other people like us. We try to sort of make sense of it. And this actually enhances this entire process. Because believe it or not, if you're completely confident with yourself and you're not so much looking on the outside what other people are thinking, it's going to take a lot longer before you actually feel like people are picking on you, right? It really is something that is enhanced by the fact that we look to the outside. And this is not to say that we care so much what other people think. It's more that we just experience what they're experiencing in that moment. And we wanna be part of that. We wanna understand it. And this actually makes us question ourselves. See, I can remember to this day, I was in first grade and we moved to another city. And so it was my first day in this new school. And I used to go to every kid that I sort of thought, okay, they look nice, they look kind. And I went up to them and said, do you want to be my friend? This question caused everybody to look at me and say, what's wrong with you? You can't just ask me to be your friend. Why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because first off, I can remember this to this day, meaning this of course had an impact on me. Second of all, I didn't understand at all that there was something wrong with asking this, with going throughout life this way. And of course, nowadays looking back, I still don't think there's anything wrong with that. But there was a long period in between the phases we're going to talk about now, where I started to look into these things and try to change them. That's the moment when we get to phase number three. 
Because at some point you have recognized that the way you would naturally behave isn't the way other people want you to be. It's not the way that other people are behaving and it's definitely not the way that gets you in with whoever you're around. For some reason, you not only are making people question if there's something wrong with you or that you're weird, but what's happening even more is that you start getting into relationships with people, friendships, romantic relationships, even authority figures, doesn't matter, but you start to create some kind of connection with that person. And at some point, something happens which makes the other person say, whoa, you just crossed a boundary, you went too far, this is way too deep for me, and then they get upset with you. Every one of us has experienced a situation like this, and again, we're flabbergasted. We don't know what's going on. And because of that, we have internalized and learned that we cannot just go up to people and be ourselves. So what do we do? We start playing the game. And with playing the game, I mean, we look at how is everybody else acting and how can I act in such a way that I won't cause trouble, that I'm not creating this harmony, that I'm not making somebody mad or uncomfortable. Because on the one hand, we don't want to be abandoned because of who we are. I mean, remember, we're still in a phase of our evolution. Most of us at this time are still kids. So of course we need inclusion. And particularly in our teenage years, this need for inclusion is so enlarged. It's so, you know, on steroids, you might say, that of course we learn how to play that game. Because we as INFJs, remember, we understand others. We understand what they want, how they think. And because of that, it becomes rather easy for us to play the game. But again, it's a game. We just know how to do it. It's a skill we learn. And before you know it, you enter phase four. And for a lot of us, this is maybe in our early 20s or in our late 20s, but this is a place where you've actually mastered this game so much, you've understood so much how it works that you try to win it. You go through life and you think, okay, I understand how this game is working. And I also understand that this person is trying to play that game as well. It's not that they're an INFJ or anything like this. It's just that every single person seems to be playing this game in order to succeed in life, in order to feel included, in order to feel successful, in order to feel seen. We sort of create connection through that. And we have learned this game so much that we are at a place where we can win it. So no matter who we meet, we seem to be able to help them because what they're going through right now we have gone through already. So we're trying to make people open their eyes and say to them, listen, this is a game, right? I see that you're struggling. Please let me help you. Of course, as most of us know, this never leads to where we want it to lead because people are not ready to hear your side of the story. They don't understand that it's possible to win this game. They don't understand that it's possible for somebody to look at it as a game because they're in it. So no matter what you tell them, they will never be able to look you straight in the face and say, yes, you're right, I'm playing a game. I'm not able to step out of that game, although you see how much I'm actually just playing this and trying to be somebody I'm not. We as INFJs, we have such a capacity not only to understand that others are playing a game, but we also see where the insecurities lie and what aspects of themselves they are not willing or able to see. And those are the things that we try to make happen. We want people to see it. We want to create a connection through that, as in, I see you, I see who you are, I see your struggle, I've been there, I connect with you on that level. But sooner or later, you recognize that no matter how much you're trying to save the other person, no matter how much you dim your light to make other people comfortable, no matter how much you try to be a supporting role in another person's movie because you want them to appreciate them for who they actually are. That if people who don't love themselves, who don't accept themselves, will never accept you. And that you will probably have made the experience that the more you try to do this, the more you're going to get hurt yourself. 
because you're not going to get the appreciation you're hoping for. And so sooner or later, the INFJ gets to phase number five. And phase number five is all about understanding that we need to change the game. The game that we're trying to win cannot be won. It is not created in a way that we can win it. Because in order to win a game like that, you have to actually meet somebody who also sees it only as a game. And so when we get to a place where we understand that we cannot force people to step out of themselves, that we cannot make people understand that it's all a game and that it's all made pretend, we get to a point where we have to recognize that we cannot wait for others. We have to make that change first. We have to say, I'm stepping out of that game. I'm willing to sort of lose the game in order to start something new. And that is the scariest part because that actually means that you go back to phase number one in many ways. You're not oblivious anymore, but you go back to being yourself, knowing that people will judge you, knowing that by you doing this, you're automatically losing the game because you're not trying to fit in at all. And so you start creating your own world. You start saying, that's how I see it. If I want to go up to somebody and I want him to be my friend, I just ask them, right? I mean, that's not something most of us do when we're adults. But the point is that even now, I don't think that there's anything wrong with a six-year-old going up to another six-year-old and asking them, do you want to be my friend? In the meantime, I thought, yeah, that was weird. I shouldn't have done this. This makes people uncomfortable. Now I think... You know, people who can't deal with that, please get out of my way. If I'm too much, go find less. Because getting to this phase is such a gift in disguise. Because only once you get here, you are allowing yourself to really tap into your gifts. Most people never get to this place because of the fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, fear of judgment. But if you get to a place where you say, no matter what I do, I cannot pretend anymore. I cannot keep playing a game that's never going to get me to where I want to be. Because what I actually want is for people in my life to get me and appreciate me for who I am. And by playing the game, I'm actually trying to make people like me for how I'm adapting, for what I'm doing for them. But I'm definitely not showing them the real side of me. Because on some level, I believe that this part of me is unlovable. It's dark, it's weird, it's unconventional. And so I had to get to a place where I started loving myself. And it's so much easier said than done, right? Oh, just love yourself. Everybody talks about that. But that's why I'm so grateful for this community. And I'm not just even talking about this channel. I just mean that the INFJ community in general is becoming more open and it's becoming more of this, you know, be who you are. We're not those, oh, you know, unique snowflakes and we are just observers and poor us. No, we're stepping into our power. And we're saying, that's the way I see the world. And I'm going to see it this way. And I'm going to be a voice because my voice matters just as much as everybody else's. And the more you do this, the less you will care if people like it or not, because the people who don't will go further away from you. And on the other hand, the people who appreciate you for you being you come closer to you. So from time to time, I encounter people who are just not in my normal sphere. And I recognize how different they are from me and how I don't feel comfortable in their presence. But I'm never in their presence anymore because I made it so obvious who I am that the people who don't appreciate that just go away by themselves. So it's on you to say, I'm ready to change the game. It's not about winning. It's not about adapting. None of that is actually the thing that's going to get us where we want. We need to change the game. We need to set the rules for ourselves. And we need to say, this is me. And now I'm creating the life the way I want it. I'm creating the INFJ epic life for me. 
Remember, if you want some more help with this and be surrounded by a community who works on this for years now and people continuously keep coming back, you know, it's lifetime access, then join the INFJ Epic Life Bootcamp. The next live round is launching January 28th and the first live call will be February 4th. So make sure you're on that waiting list. I can't wait to see you there. All the information you need, you can find in the links in the description. And if you want to watch another video now that is in alignment with today's topic, then watch the video why the INFJ ages in reverse.